If you want to open your Bibles to John 5, we are going to be diving into the Word of God today, and uh, the Lord really gave me two clear scriptures that I want to go through, and while you are turning there, uh, I'm just kind of giving you an announcement, but I have two of my really good friends, uh, Brooke Lighty and Regan Cruz. Uh, They're going to be joining today, and I asked them to, to play behind me as I speak, um, and that, that might be a new idea. And for some of you, you might even be like, ah, that actually makes it harder to hear. It's a little distracting. Um, the point is not to make it more interesting. This isn't necessarily like a movie soundtrack moment. Um, but Second Kings 3 uh, actually shares a story where Elisha is going to prophesy. And he says, bring me a musician. And the scriptures say, when the musician played, the spirit of prophecy came upon Elisha. And he prophesied. Um, And I believe that the spirit of the musicians and the singers as they play and as they worship, not only does it come through their music, but it actually places uh, anointing and prophetic clarity. And so, uh, and I might weave in and out of moments. I might pause for a minute. We might pray or or we might just reflect or wait on the Lord. And and, and so uh, I know that for some of you, there might be moments where like, oh man, it's kind of hard to hear. I wish we didn't have that, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just as important as actually the words that I'm sharing because I believe that the presence of God is resting and dwelling, inhabiting the praises and the music that's being played. So today we're going to uh, dive through this story in John 5 um, that many of you know, uh, but we're going to just ask for the Lord to kind of bring some, some themes in. I'm going to be reading a lot out of the, the New King James uh, version, but the, the title of this sermon is, Do You Want to Be Made Well? Do You Want to Be Made Well? And I'm going to jump in and I'm going to read the scripture. I want to encourage you to read along, uh, and then we're going to go through it together. John 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man who had been, who had had an infirmity 38 years Sorry, I'll read that again. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. I have so much scribble in my Bible. Sometimes it's hard to read uh, the actual words that are there. Uh, Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And the day was the Sabbath. This is a scripture and a passage that I have just been chewing on for uh, a long time. Um, It's something that the Lord started unpacking to me right about this time last year. And uh, it was uh, it was a season for me and my family. We had some difficulties that that um, brought some some pressure and and hardship and confusion. And and I was feeling just uh, just the lack of clarity from the Lord, the lack of the presence of God and. And uh, I, I just felt one day, I'm like, man, I just, I need to get away with Jesus. I need to not lead anything for two days. I need to not bring my phone, not have any internet. And I just need to go and spend time with Jesus because I feel like I can't really hear his voice. I don't know what he's saying. I'm, I'm feeling these pressures and anxiety and depression just knocking at the door. And uh, I got in my truck. And I was driving to the location, you know, where I was spending this two days. And I got to the location, it had been like 15 minutes, and I forgot my keys to let me into this spot. And I was just like, 
just already in just an insanely sour mood. I'm like, this retreat's going to be terrible. Nothing's going to happen. And I'm just like, I'm just going off and venting as I'm driving back. It's, uh, it's snowing. And so uh, the roads are slippery and I'm just kind of mumbling and having a bad attitude. And, and I'm just sitting there driving and I just hear crystal clear in my spirit. The Lord say, do you want to be made well? And I just sat under the weight of that phrase for the next like 15, 20 minutes. Uh, it was one of those moments that it really just arrested me. It just, uh, it, it, I stopped exactly where I was at and I knew it was not just my own subconscious telling me that. It was not just my memory recalling a scripture that I had read before, but it was the voice that was proceeding from the Father, the words that were being spoken over me from him and and I sat under the weight of that and I got to the retreat and and I I walked in the door and uh, as I walked in, I mean, it felt like something out of the the shack where I I immediately, I was just greeted by the Prince of Peace. And I was in that moment aware of how long I had been living without the peace of Jesus in my life. And I'm not going to go into uh, every detail of it, but it was just a two-day period of unraveling where the Lord dove deep into issues in my heart and said, okay, let's talk about this. It wasn't just like, do you want to be made well? And I just kind of got some goosebumps and then I left. He really dove deep uh, and began rewriting things and uprooting things that have been there for a long time. And, And my prayer today uh, is, is for this moment not to just be uh, some information for your mind, but I believe this invitation, do you want to be made well, is something that Jesus is offering to his church, and I believe he's offering it to you today. So we're going to go through some of these, these different phrases. The first one that really jumped out to me was uh, where it says, in Jerusalem there's this gate, and by it lay a great multitude of sick people. And I think that could be such a clear allegory for where our culture is right now. We need to be honest and say, we are sick. We really are. There is a sickness of division, of hatred, of depression, of hopelessness. Uh, I just recently watched a documentary that really went through the statistics of in those last 10 years since social media has really risen to a place of prominence, that depression, anxiety, and suicide among teenagers has doubled in 10 years. That is an unbelievable statistic to, to, to see something that, that should just cause our hearts to, to take notice and, and to, to weep and to, to hear something this strong. And, and yet it's almost like just another statistic because there's so much sickness happening right now in our culture. And uh, what I love about this story is you have this place where all these sick people are gathered, which I think is such a picture of right now. And then you have Jesus. And Jesus is pure. He's clean. My personal theological belief is that Jesus never was even sick because he didn't even have a sin nature for sickness to ever have a hold on him. He conquered sickness, sin, and death, and he laid down his life. It would have been impossible for sickness to take his life from him. And and yet Jesus in that place, he walks among the sick. He doesn't go to the house of those who are well, but Jesus says, "Where, where are all the sick people? That's where I'm going to be. And right now when, you know, we're in a season and, and it's wisdom to, of course, not be around people that are sick, but our culture is built right now in avoiding people that are sick. And I think we're doing that in the natural. There's some wisdom, but I think we're doing it as well in the spiritual where there is, there is a, we are trying to fix ourselves and we are trying to, when we see people that are sick and hurting and broken, our immediate reaction is to judge. Our immediate reaction is look at what's wrong with them. They don't, you know, and, and pull out this finger and, and break into the spirit of division. And Jesus didn't go there to judge. Jesus didn't go there to tell these people how they should vote in the next election. Jesus went there for one reason, one reason alone. He was the healer and he had the words of life. And in this hour of great sickness, I just want to say so clearly, there may be sickness and plague all around us, but God 
is not silent. God has not forgotten us. God is not distant or far from us. I believe that his voice is actually clearer and louder in this hour. There might be more confusion and chaos in the world that's causing many to not hear it, but God is speaking. And when we see in this story, it says, now there was a certain man there. And what I love about this story is that Jesus didn't just walk into this crowd of diseased people and he was like, behold, and just kind of like waved his hand and was like, you are now healed and just kind of like floated off or, you know, just went somewhere to, to haunt other people. But he walked into a multitude and he scanned through the crowd and he saw a certain man. And I feel like right now, like we have been sold the lie that we are just one of the crowd. And even it's seeped into our Christianity where we're like, man, Jesus, he loves me, but he loves everybody. And God does not love people in the same way that he loves you. What do I mean by that? God loves you uniquely. God might not love you less than someone else and he might not love you more than than someone else. We know that isn't true, but he has a unique measure of love for you specifically. And he is not looking just for a corporate people, but he is looking at the individuals. He's looking at the certain man and he sees that certain man. And then it says he saw that he was in that condition for a long time. Can you feel the compassion of Jesus in this moment? Jesus looked at him and and he didn't just see a disease. His compassion was stirred because he saw that he had been in that condition for a long time. And uh, when I went on this retreat, while the Lord was unraveling these, these things, it had been about an hour, I was just worshiping and feeling his peace. And then I, I felt Jesus say, okay, Caleb, it's, it's time to talk about some things. It's time to talk. And in that moment, the Lord said, Caleb, you have been praying and asking for the Lord to come and deliver, you, deliver me from anxiety, from depression, and from heaviness. And then he said this phrase, he's like, Caleb, it's like depression, anxiety, those are just the symptoms The praise and rejection of man is the poison and pride is the plague. And when the Lord spoke that, I had, uh, I've never experienced it like I experienced it in this moment, but I had the deepest sense of conviction I had ever felt. And my, my life played out like a movie. I saw these pictures from the time I was four years old and to present day, where I had seen where I had let pride into my heart. And even as I say that phrase, it sounds so intense, but I can't exaggerate how loved and cared for I felt in that moment. And I was weeping and feeling the conviction of the Lord, but not because I felt condemned, but because I felt that Jesus was taking time to answer that question that he posed me, do you want to be made well? And uh, it was interesting because it actually happened the month before COVID hit and the Lord ended up speaking a ton about disease and plague that was, that was in my heart. And, uh, and the Lord, he loved me so much and he's such a father that he didn't just give me general spiritual ideas. Like he zoomed in a bunch. And so I'm going to, I'm just going to go through that. My goal in this, look, this is what the Lord spoke to me. I'm not trying to, to speak convictions on you. I'm just trying to present and to speak out what the Lord said to me. But the Lord asked me four questions And the first one really surprised me. And then as I kind of progressed through these questions, I I saw where he was getting to. So the first one that I heard from the Lord, and this one might make you laugh a little bit, but the Lord said, did I, did I tell you to get a smartphone? And, uh, I heard that question and, and I like laughed and I was like, well, no, but, and I'm trying to describe this encounter as best as I can. I don't always have the perfect words to articulate it. But what the Lord took me back to, I actually remember the place I was when I decided to get this iPhone, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. And I was in my parents' kitchen back in New York. And uh, 
And what I, what I, when the Lord said that, what I saw and I sensed is what I signed up for an iPhone, it was super innocuous. I did not think I was signing up for this thing that I was gonna have in my hand for five hours a day. I thought I was getting a cool phone that I could like play music on, take pictures on, and it like looked pretty cool. Like that's what I signed up for. And it's interesting, if you watch the original keynote from Steve Jobs, it's about 30 minutes into the keynote that he first refer uh, references anything that looks like modern day texting or social media or app usage. It was almost all the camera and the phone and like things like the calculator. Like even Steve Jobs, the visionary he was, never foresaw the way that this one device would change the world. And, and again, I'm, I'm not saying this for condemnation because, uh, and I'll kind of show you the, the questions as they go, but the, the point that Jesus was making to me when he said that was, I didn't, I wasn't the one who led you to do that. And you might not have known what you got into, but it's, it's important to know because when Jesus tells you to do something, he gives you the grace to enable it. And he's like, there's actually some sickness in your soul I want to deal with, but I, wanna, I want you to know it's, that sickness isn't because anything I gave you. That was something that you took for yourself. And so, uh, again, I, di I didn't feel heavy in that moment, but I, I did kind of laugh. And, and then the, the, the second question the Lord asked was, what good has happened because of your smartphone? And, and what he meant by that was social media and all those things. Um, and it was actually genuine. In that moment, I was thinking of, I, I travel a lot. So all the times I got to FaceTime my kids and how beautiful that was. Thinking about being able to text certain friends, the way songwriting has become easier in a lot of different contexts and, and the way I'm able to worship with other brothers and sisters. There was a genuine uh, a thankfulness that I felt. It's like, oh man, there's a lot of good that's, that's happened. And of course I could kind of feel the next question that was coming. Okay, what's the bad? And what's the evil that's happened because of it? And in that moment, I realized I had always kind of justified my use and how much and because, oh, well, look at the good fruit that's happening. But the Lord doesn't say, okay, I'm setting up your life and giving you something to bear a lot of good fruit, but it's going to bear a lot of bad fruit too. But just kind of, you know, just make it work and, you know, hopefully more good than bad. Uh, that's not the gospel. <laughs> That's not how we were designed to live. We were designed to have the bad pruned. And, and, and I realized how much I had justified of, of poison that I led into my own heart and soul that was actually uh, making me sick. And I had justified it because of the good. And the Lord's like, man, I, I, I'm so good that I, I'll use that even amidst the, the bad. But I want you to feel the weight of that. And then he asked me one more question and I wasn't really emotional until he asked the last question. And he said, what hasn't happened because you got that phone? And again, like a movie, I played images and pictures of times that I wasn't present with my family when I should have been, times that I should have paid attention and seen that God was doing something, but I was stuck on my phone, I, I, I saw times that I could have worshiped and given Jesus my attention, but just out of habit, I was just just kind of dulling this, this boredom that I felt inside. And, and I don't think it was on purpose or, uh, you know, it, it was necessarily created and crafted to be that, but just me, myself, I had just let that creep in to the point where I had cured my own boredom. There was this disease of boredom and uh, you know what? I could take an aspirin for it called grabbing my phone whenever I wanted to. I had a disease of feeling distant from God, and, but I had, a, I had aspirin. But the thing about aspirin is it doesn't actually fix the problem. It just dulls it. And the Lord's like, what if you're actually supposed to feel that? What if you're actually supposed to feel bored in moments? What if you're actually supposed to feel your, your lack of the nearness of God and that is actually meant to drive you to the presence of God, but you have medicated and allowed a disease and a plague to grow deeper. And uh, <clears throat> in that moment, you know, I, I knew what, what the Lord was saying, and, and, and don't worry, this is not leading to, we're not gonna have like a phone burning party at the end. And you're, you're like watch party host is like, all right, we're starting a fire. And if you love God, you'll put your phone in. Uh, 
that's not the point at all. And there's many people that are using it and, and are able to, to use the, the good. But I do feel that in my story and, and what the Lord was speaking, I think it's for more than, than me because I do see a generation that we have been connected to each other, but we haven't been grafted into the vine. That we have replaced communion with God with connection with people to be nonstop connected to other people where they can get a hold of us. We've stayed on this level and we've traded in the God-given gift of communion with him. Like Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the day, we've traded that in so that we could be connected. And some good things have happened in that connection. But I really believe right now in this time where we are seeing hatred and anger explode like we've never seen, Jesus is asking the question, are you drinking the poison of, of man's opinion instead of putting yourself before the Father and hearing his thoughts and his voice? And for me, I knew the answer was that I had been subjecting myself to man's thoughts and opinions, probably to a 10 to 1 ratio to God's thoughts. And, uh, you know, I just remember praying like, Lord, I, I, I have to change something and I, I, I have to have something that that looks different for me, but feeling, you know, overwhelmed in that moment. And, and we can feel overwhelmed, even in these messages, we can be like, oh my gosh, like I feel those things, but I also feel this pressure and, and heaviness and, and condemnation. Um, but that's not where the story ends for us. And that's not where the story ends for, for this guy, because he has this disease and this infirmity that Jesus didn't give him, but Jesus cared enough to see him spot him where he was at and to bring life to him. And, and I feel that today and for you, that you are that certain man, that Jesus is not dealing with you like, like a face in the crowd, but he is walking up to you. He sees you and he sees the condition that you've been in for a long time. And he's asking you a question. Do you want to be made well? And I love this this question, do you want to be made well? Because we know that when Jesus asks a question, he's not looking for information. He's looking to reveal the condition of the heart. And we see the condition of this man's heart revealed. I just wanna read that again. Jesus said, do you wanna be made well? The sick man answered, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool, but when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming another steps down, before me. Here's what happened. Jesus asked the question, do you want to be made well? And we see the man respond with the condition of his heart. And listen to the first thing he said. He said, sir, I have no one. Now it's interesting because this man is in the middle of a multitude. He's in the middle of a crowd. He's connected to so many people. And yet the feeling he has inside is I have no one. And this man thought that Jesus, when he said, do you want to be made well, was questioning his effort. Jesus was not questioning this man's effort. He was trying to stir the waters of his soul for faith and hope. But listen to that first lie. And I think there's two lies that the enemy feeds us to keep us sick. And that first one is I have no one. I'm alone. The reason I'm sick is because I'm alone. No one loves me. No one sees me. People at church, they don't even notice me. My friends don't really invest in me. My pastors and leaders, they don't care about me. I'm the only one who, who cares for me. And the reason I'm sick, the reason I'm not doing well is because I'm alone. And I feel like this is where so many of us are at. And then the next one that he says is, and, and when I do try my hardest, somebody tries a little bit harder. There's someone out there who's not alone, and then there's someone whose effort's better, i.e., what is he saying? If I just could give more effort, then I could be healed. And the thing about healing is you can't effort your way to healing. You can't get there through 
working harder, trying harder. And that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to heal our, we're like, oh, you know, and that, that word, like, you know, man, I want to be emotionally healthy. Like, I want to be whole. I want to be healed. Like, we use these words and then we're like, man, I want to be healed. I want to be whole. And so because I want to be, be whole, I'm, you know, I'm changing this thing and I'm doing this thing, you know, and I'm burning my phone. And, you know, I, I have these nine, 10 things I'm going to do because, because what? I, I'm trying to get myself into the pool so I can get healing because I think that my effort will be met with, with wholeness. But Isaiah 53 says, by Jesus's stripes, you're healed. Your healing is not found in your effort. It's found in the cross. It's found in a suffering savior who took the pain and affliction, not so you would never experience any, but to pay the penalty and cost so he could stand in front of you and say, do you want to be made well? And in this moment, Jesus revealed the condition of this man's heart where he believed he was in isolation, which was not true. And then he believed that it was a matter of his effort and it wasn't true. And the same is true right now and today. It's not a matter of effort. And there's something that the Lord is even doing in the midst of a pandemic. And did you notice that when, when this thing started, you know, man, we're so wise in our own opinions. We're like, we're so smart right now. This is the information age. We know how to do everything. We're so great. We're so much smarter than those stupid older generations that didn't know anything. You know, like the, we love to like make fun of like, you know, the boomer generation and those before it, like we're so much smarter. And then COVID hit and what happened? No one knew what to do. Man's wisdom was laid waste in a moment and suddenly world leaders, politicians, you know, the influencers of our society that seemed so wise in a moment, nobody knew what to do. And I believe, I don't believe that the Lord initiated or created or crafted COVID at all. But I do believe that in the midst of it, he was bringing the wisdom of man to nothing. We're saying, man, you are trying to do this thing by effort, but I am trying to heal you, but it's not an issue of effort. So he stands in front of this man. And what does he say? The first word that comes out is rise. Why is that powerful? Because when Jesus speaks a word, the grace and power to walk out that word exist within the command itself. There is healing in the voice of Jesus speaking to you. But first, Jesus wants you to reveal the condition of your own heart. Jesus could have walked right up to him and been like, all right, dude, rise, get up. He did that with most people. He just spoke a word and just healed them in that moment. But Jesus walks up. Why? Because he cared about this man's heart. He cared about his soul more than he even cared about his body. Because he knew that he could come and touch this man's body in a moment and he could get up and walk, but he could still be a cripple in his spirit and his soul if he goes on believing that he's alone and that his effort is what's going to heal him. So Jesus says, I'm patient and kind enough that I'm gonna ask you a question, do you wanna be made well? And to this man's credit, he didn't give some garbage answer. He didn't say, you know, oh Lord, it was the desire of my heart as a young boy that I should walk. And I read through the Psalms, oh, 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 miracle worker. And I have, my soul has craved that, you know, he didn't go into this religious, ridiculous language. He knew who Jesus was. He knew he was a rabbi. He knew that this dude knew theology like nobody else and knew the Old Testament. But you know what? He didn't try to impress. He didn't try to put on a show. He actually just told Jesus where he was at. And when Jesus is asking us the question, do you want to be made well? Do not run to the, the, the result of the healing. Man, I don't want to have depression or anxiety anymore. Man, I don't want to be sick. I mean, I, I want my relationships to be fixed and, and healed. And God, why won't you heal me? Why won't you heal me? And he's asking the question, do you want to be made well? Because there is a sickness and a disease and a poison that goes deeper than the physical affliction of what we are seeing right now that's made manifest. And he wants to bring healing, but we have to respond by giving him that honest answer of our heart saying, Lord, there are things in my heart that are stopping me from 
who are walking in healing. But then Jesus says, rise. What a word for Jesus, the man who himself will rise from the dead, the man whose name is the resurrection, the man who was there before the foundations of the world and picked this man out and created his DNA and breathed his life into this man, stood before him and said the word, rise. Every instance of healing in the gospel, except for one, was a result of Jesus speaking. There is healing in Jesus's voice. And the one time that he didn't speak was a woman who responded to a word where she knew that the scripture said there was healing in his wings. And so she held on to the tassel, the hem of his garment, which was called the wings of the rabbi and took hold of it because she was responding to a word. If we cannot hear the voice of God speak to us, we will stay in the same condition. We need to hear his voice and we need to hear him speak. His voice is what heals. His voice is what liberates. When the Lord spoke these phrases to me and unpacked these, these things in this moment, there was a deep deliverance that I couldn't have, I couldn't have paid enough counselors to get there in my heart. It just took a few words of the Lord speaking. And it was mostly not even him speaking. He mostly just asked me a few questions. And in that moment, he was speaking and healing things. But you know what? The, the main lie for me that the Lord was speaking to you was that you're alone, that you're not seen. And the Lord showed me a moment when I was four years old. When I looked at a moment where my, my dad, my, my dad in the natural, my father was loving on my sister and uh, calling her beautiful and just celebrating her beauty. And, and Satan came in in that moment and said, look how your dad loves her. You're gonna have to earn that. And in that moment, I was enlisted into the army of effort. There was something in me that was like, yes, I'm supposed to be loved but I gotta get there myself. I gotta work, I gotta earn. And, and in this moment last year, I, I lived 33 years where I really felt like my effort was what would make me whole. And then Jesus in a moment just said, what has what your effort done? Has it made you whole? Are you, are you healed? And just in those questions, he revealed himself and then he spoke. He spoke the word rise. And I believe this is a word for the hour for the church. He is not going to leave us in this condition. He is the God who steps into the multitude, finds us, searches us out, asks us the question of our hearts, draws out the answer of our heart, and then says, rise. And then I love the next phrase. He says, take up your bed. What's the point of him taking up his bed? Because Jesus could have been like, hey, you know what? Why don't you have someone take you home? And then at midnight, when no one else sees, I don't want to hurt anyone else's feelings, I'm going to heal you. Because man, if everybody around you, if they see you healed and they're not healed, man, they're going to be jealous. They're going to be angry. They're going to be offended at me. And I don't want them offended at me. I want them to love me. I'm Jesus. But what does Jesus do? He finds them in the middle of, he finds them right in the middle of sick people and he says, rise. But don't just rise and walk. I want you to take your bed and parade it around. I want the religious people to see it. I want the sick people to see it. I want the healed people to see it. I want everyone to see that you are healed. And they will know it's nothing that you earned because there was no stirring in the water. There's only one answer to that, and that's Jesus. Look, we are not in this hour. I'm speaking to so many artists and creatives and worship leaders, and we are so busy trying to find the answers ourselves. And we're doing a good job in some senses of being honest and, and, and really talking about what the problem is. But if I can just speak prophetically for a moment, I don't hear a lot of people in the church artists and creatives presenting the answer. I don't hear hope that looks like 
Yes, we, we are sick and we're in need of healing, but Jesus is the healer and he will not leave us in this condition. And he is calling us, and I believe he's calling us today to rise and take up our bed and walk. And in that obedience, in the obedience of just walking out our wholeness, it is going to provoke a world around us. And listen, we, I, the church does need to, to empathize. And in the midst of national pain and, and difficulty, art and worship and music and dance and expressions of art are so valuable. But we can't be creating things in and of our own self and souls. We need to be hearing what God is saying in this hour because if his voice doesn't speak, then we don't become healed. We don't become whole. I want to read one more story and then we're going to spend some time just in prayer together. It's a story in 1 Kings 18. And I'm going to just retell a little bit and then I'm going to read the, the, the scripture. But in this story... Elijah, his entire life has lived up to one showdown. He prophesied that it's not going to rain for three and a half years. The heavens were shut up. Israel went into a famine. Ahab and Jezebel are trying to kill him. He steps on the scene. He's like, all right, let's do this, baby. Let's do a showdown. You know, my God, your God, let's do this thing once and for all. Who's the real God? And I love, I love Elijah's grit. Like the, <laughs> the, the taunts that he's giving them. He's like, oh, maybe your God's sleeping. And, and, and I, some of the translations are bad, but he's literally saying like, maybe your God's in the bathroom. Maybe he's taking a dump right now. And that's why he can't hear you and do anything in that moment. He's just mocking the prophets of Baal in that, and Baal and Asherah. And then he steps up, he prays, fire falls from heaven. And then they take the prophets of Baal and Asherah and they slaughter them. This is what Elijah has been dreaming about his entire life. Now, if that's not enough, then he goes into intercession, he prays. And right then, after the seventh time, they see the cloud the size of a man's fist and they see that rain is on the horizon. And all of a sudden, Elijah runs with supernatural strength. He runs faster than a horse, which is probably like 40 miles an hour, which had to have looked absolutely incredible because he was like girding up his loins and like running with like a garment. So you just see like this old dude like sprinting like 40 miles an hour and just like outrunning the chariot. And, and every dream that Elijah has had for revival, for influence, it's all happening. You know, it's like, it's happening. Like this is the moment, this is amazing. And then he gets the telegram from Jezebel. And I imagine in that moment that he's like, oh my gosh, God made himself real. The prophets are dead. You know what? They're going to invite me into the palace. I'm going to be the official prophet. I'm going to, I'm going to live in the, in, in, in the king's palace and live in the luxuries. And Israel's going to be in revival. This is going to be amazing. And he opens up the telegram and it's like, hey, it's Jezebel. I'm like, oh yeah, what does she have to say? Uh, I hope I die if you're not dead by this time tomorrow because I'm coming after you and I'm going to kill you. And It said Elijah became so depressed that he said in uh, in verse four, and he prayed that he might die. And he said, it's enough. Take my life for I'm no better than that of my father. Why? Because God wanted to exceed Elijah's expectations, but he had to disappoint them first. Because Elijah had thought this moment was leading up to being obedient for what God said and that it was going to elicit a certain response. And then he didn't get that response. And he was sick. He was like the man at the pool of Bethesda, disillusioned. I thought it was going to look like this, but it looked like this. I thought my marriage was going to be this, but it's this. I thought if I was in ministry for 10 years, I would be free of this and I'm not. I thought this, I thought if I did that and there's a heaviness and a depression that comes in that place. And I love uh, the Lord's answer in verse verse seven. He says, arise and eat because the journey is too great. So he rose and ate and drank and went in strength. Uh, And that was the second time he ate. The first time he he ate and took a nap. I love that that God was like, all right, man, you just need a nap and you need a snack. Like you're hungry, dude. Like go ahead and have some food and, and, and you'll be doing a little bit better. And Elijah comes and he goes somewhere interesting. He goes into a cave in Sinai. What's interesting about him going into a cave in Sinai 
is we see two other instances in scripture where men go into the cave in Sinai. The first one is Moses in Exodus 33 and 34, otherwise known as the cleft of the rock, where he went and hid himself away in the cave and isolated and away from where everyone else was, the Lord drew him away to this cave and revealed who he really was. And then the other time you see Paul right after getting saved, he goes to Arabia and and he goes to a cave in Sinai. And who knows if this is the same cave or not. I I like to think Pastor Pastor Lee came up with the theory that he thinks that that all three of the caves were the same. I I, I happen to, to love that. But either way, this cave, this cleft of the rock, this hidden place where nobody else was in scriptures represented revelation. It represented three men that came to the end of themselves. The first was Moses saying, Lord, I did everything. And these stupid people built a golden calf and worshiped it. Like they are worthless. Just, I just, I'm done with these people. And God's like, I'm done with them. I'm gonna destroy them. And Moses is like, Lord, If you don't show me your glory, I can't do this. And then Paul, who just was at the end of himself, he was, you know, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He had power, he had religion, he had all these things, and he was brought to absolutely nothing. He says, Lord, I need you to speak who I am and what I'm called to do. And then you have Elijah in this moment. And let me just read this scripture here in verse 11. I'm gonna drink some water first. Verse 11, then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Verse 13, so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in a mantle and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And look at what Elijah says right at the end of verse 14. Oh, actually, I'll read the whole verse. I've been zealous for the Lord God of hosts. Effort. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. Huh, I'm alone and my effort wasn't even good enough. And Elijah's in this cave and he's broken. His disillusionment is engulfing him. Everything that he thought was gonna happen didn't happen. And he called down fire from heaven, but his heart was not whole. And God said, I wanna show you something. And he leads him up and he shows wind, earthquake and fire. Here's what's interesting about that. Cause it says the Lord was not in those things. Well, Job makes it pretty clear that those things don't happen on their own, that God is the originator and the creator of those things. And so in a very real way, God was sending those things, but this, here's what the scripture's saying. God is sending those things. Those are evidence of his work, his power, his might, and his hand, but God isn't in those things. Those three things pass by him. And then it said, after, a still small voice. One translation that I like even better says the voice of gentle silence. The voice didn't even say anything, but Elijah knew that he was to go back to the mouth of the cave. He goes to the mouth of the cave. He pours out his heart, just like the man at the pool. And he says, I'm alone. My effort's not enough. And the Lord asks him a question. Why are you here, Elijah? And what's the answer to why Elijah was here? If Elijah had seen the earthquake, the wind, and the fire, 
and he was fearful, he would have missed the voice. If he was distracted, he was just like, wow, this is absolutely crazy. What's like, and just taking it all in, he would have missed it. Or what about a fence? I could just see Elijah being like, oh, big, strong God. Look at this earthquake, wind, and fire. That's super helpful. How about Israel? They're kind of terrible. I did everything I could, and look at you. Oh, now you're going to move. Oh, now. Oh, here it comes now. How about that fire at the palace where I need it? He could have been offended. Elijah recognized God was doing something, but he waited. And Elijah had lived his whole life and he thought it was all about the effect of what his obedience was gonna speak. But there was a voice that came after the earthquake, wind and the fire. It was a voice of gentle silence. Here's what I think. I don't think he heard anything. I think he felt the still small voice of the presence of God that he had felt since the time he was a boy. And he thought the point of that voice was to lead him to do ministry and to do great things that others could see. And God snapped the disillusionment of that right before his eyes. And I think that Elijah had missed, the point of the still small voice was not to get him to give his effort towards something. The point was the still small voice. His presence is everything. And when he felt that same gentle presence that he had leaned into his whole life, he knew it was time to go to the mouth of the cave and for the Lord to speak. And what the Lord spoke at the mouth of the cave, we won't go into, but it was revelation that he had never spoken to anyone else. He told him who was gonna be king, who Elijah was gonna anoint next. He, he, he laid out Israel's next hundred years, basically, in this moment because he responded to the still, small voice, because he listened to the voice that was speaking all along, but he had let other things crowd. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come back up. And I feel that in an hour that we are so desperate for healing and clarity, we're running to everything but the voice of God. You know where the revelation to lead the nation came for Moses? It was to go and it was to wait in the cave of revelation. You know where it was for Elijah? It was to go and wait in the cave of revelation. You know who it was for Paul? It was go and wait in the cave of revelation. But instead of going to the cave where it's just us and the Lord, where we let him unpack and release the things that are in our heart, the accusation against God, and let him speak his truth, we run to the opinions of man. What are other people saying? What are other people doing? We're drinking of a poison called the praise and rejection of men. We're expecting ourselves to be healed. And I believe today at True North, the Lord is not wanting to condemn you. He's not wanting to, 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 I know that there's moments of, of heaviness in this word, but, but the Lord is not here because he wants to condemn you. He is asking you the question, do you want to be made well? And let me answer in some sense that question. The healing is in the voice of God. Creatives, worship leaders, songwriters, musicians, singers, dancers, artists, painters, graphic design, video, We have to lean into the voice of gentle silence. We have to take time. And I think the hour is past where we could, you know what, I can take some time once a week and spend some time with God. If we're not hearing his voice daily, then there's part of our soul that's dying. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. The rhema word, God is speaking and there is healing in his wings. 
And we're going to spend some time just ministering and singing and playing. And in this moment of just being able to do business with the Lord, our goal is to clear out all the other distractions. Say, Lord, you speak. You speak the words, rise, take up your bed and walk. You speak the words that only you can speak. If you want to convict, convict. If you want to strengthen, strengthen. If you want to tear down, tear down. If you want to build up, build up. But we have to hear the voice of God. It cannot be revelation from somebody else. It cannot be secondhand revelation. We have to know the voice of God ourselves because we have to be healed and whole in this hour. The world around us is dying. And the Lord has gifted us with the gift of music and art and creativity, not so we could draw attention to ourselves and poison people further, but so that we could be the display of God's healing power, that our lives would be the artwork that puts Jesus's healing on display, that our lives, and or sorry, that our art would be the bed that we take up and show the healing, mercy, compassion, love, and passion of Jesus who is looking to speak. Jesus has not given up on this generation. This is not a hopeless hour. This is a moment for us to rise. This is a moment for us to stand. This is a moment for us to walk in the healing of God, but we can't unless we are willing to do business with him in the secret place and hear his voice to walk in that. So right now, we're just gonna take a few moments to reflect for a moment. And in this reflection, Maybe you pull out your journals, we'll sit and be in a place of uh, uh, where there's no distraction. I want you to do business with God. You know, my hope is you didn't just, you know, hear someone who's like, you know, don't use technology, it's all bad, it's all sending you to hell. I, I hope that you heard the narrative of what the Father was speaking to me and he might not be saying the same application, but I believe that he's saying the same words. And so we're going to take a moment and wait on the Lord. And then we're going to sing around that theme.
I was just feeling faith as Natasha was singing. The healing is flowing. I was just feeling the Lord just declare healing, declare my heart. So I just wanna pray that over us, even from the Lord's perspective. And I just, in this moment while we're reflecting, this isn't just a, a, our own ability to figure things out in our head. This is us receiving the word and the, the voice of God that he's speaking to us. So I declare healing and life over you in the name of Jesus. I declare that no weapon formed against you will prosper. I declare that your father and that your maker is robed in garments of healing and there's healing in his wings. The Lord says, I see you. I see that you have been in your condition a long time. Today is the day of healing. Today is the day where I speak a different word and a better word. Lord, right now I ask for those who are suffering with mental illness, Lord, I ask specifically for anxiety and depression, Lord, that has been inflamed in this season. Lord, where there has been sickness, Lord, and there's chemical issues, there's issues of circumstances and the enemy has been using this to discourage and to depress and to disarm his people. But we say this far and no more, Lord. We ask for you to send a healing wave. Lord, right now, that you would show yourself as the line of the tribe of Judah, that you would judge sickness in this generation, that you would judge mental sickness, Lord, that you would judge the enemies of suicide. Lord, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. God, people are not our enemy in this hour, but the devourer is the enemy. And so, Lord, I ask that you would declare, rise, take up your bed and walk. Rise and be filled with the hope that comes from your maker declaring life over you. So Lord, right now, we just declare healing and life in the name of Jesus.
for your voice. Jesus, your voice is everything. It's everything. God, I ask that you would remove every barrier from your presence. I love just the themes of today, even the the singing of let me wash your feet. I feel that so ties in because I, I feel like there's just shame that is trying to stop us from being in God's presence. But if we knew that every time we go to that cave to hear his voice, we're not greeted with, a, with an angry, austere God who's, what's wrong with you? Why weren't you here earlier? Here's all the thing that's wrong with you. But we're greeted with a father who is waiting for us in secret. And he is there to lavish his love and affections on us, to speak truth, to speak identity, to speak hope, and to speak a future. Then we would be so, more, so much more confident and comfortable going into his presence. And so I just feel like we're supposed to close this time by just putting our eyes on Jesus. And so I'm going to throw the worship team for a loop here. And I, I want to sing that chorus of all hail King Jesus and take this moment to put our eyes on Jesus and end with the song of praise. We want to get our eyes off ourselves and to look at Jesus to hear his voice. The door is thanksgiving. The courts are praise. And so let's walk through that door of thanksgiving and into the courts and praise Jesus for who he is. Oh, hail King Jesus. Oh, hail receive the hope and peace and joy that comes in Jesus and in Jesus alone. We lift our eyes and we see you on the cross. And we also see you exalted and highly lifted up, resurrected, beaming with glory and light. We say all hail, world you're gonna see, city you're gonna see, US you're gonna see, Jesus, seated on the throne and lifted high. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.